As we all know, February is the shortest month of the year, but nevertheless, I actually managed to complete a fair few games during the month, which is actually more impressive when you find out that I've also taken up Dota 2, because what I really needed was another time sync game with no end, and let's not even talk about the toxic community. Anyway, let's get into what I played last month, starting with The Walking Dead Saints and Sinners. Now, typical of me, I've actually had this game for quite a while, and this was actually my second run at completing it, and right off the bat, I gotta say that I do not love this. After playing Red Matter 1 and 2 last month, my bath for what makes a VR game really good is pretty damn high, and despite releasing two years after the first game, this still feels like a much earlier VR game in a lot of ways. Don't get me wrong, as a whole package, this does vastly more than Red Matter 1 and probably Red Matter 2 if I'm honest, and it boasts a far lengthier runtime than either or both combined. But my main issue with this game is the way that the story is told. So you start the game being told that you're called The Tourist, and you've come to New Orleans after hearing about a bunker full of supplies hidden somewhere underneath the semi-flooded city. Obviously, you're not the only one that's heard about this, and there are two major factions already at work in the city fighting to survive and track down this bunker. The story is told via an extended opening cutscene where you sail through the city, getting a good look at each side, and of course, the walkers that connect us all. Once you land, you find your contact dead, and you claim his old base inside an abandoned school bus. From here, you'll be able to do all kinds of crafting to make food, medicine, and of course, various weapons. The gameplay loop from here is going to different parts of the city via the raft. Once they collect supplies, talk to survivors, complete quests, and uncover more of what's going on as you explore the city. Eventually, you get into contact with Casey over the radio, who gives you a little bit more guidance, as well as May, who's wanted by basically everyone. And the main problem I had with the game was the story and the way it was told. Everything is just stationary conversations, and when you're in VR, you become very aware that you're standing in your room with a switch taped to your head. These long conversations would be fine in a flat screen game, but in VR, they just don't work for me, especially if I can't walk around whilst talking. If I could at least craft in my base while talking to Casey on the radio, I could be doing something whilst also listening. But no, I have to stand there, occasionally pressing a button to choose dialogue till I get my next quest. Story aside, the gameplay here is actually pretty good, but never really blew me away. The melee combat is very meaty, with everything having a really good weight, and making each walker brain stab feel very visceral. Human combat with guns is fine, but there are so many other VR games with far better guns, so it kind of struggles to compete there. The game's also split into days, with you having just enough time to travel to a zone, explore it for a little while until you have to rush back before nightfall when the undead are a lot more active. As the days go on, there are less supplies to be found and more undead, at least that's what the game tells you, I never really noticed a difference from the start all the way to the end, so it made everything just a little bit repetitive. Now I will take some of the blame for my disinterest in this game since I tended to use the shittiest stuff that I had and save my really good gear for later, except later never came, so I ended the game with like 3 AR-15s in my coat rack like the average American. I also feel like I've hit a bit of Walking Dead fatigue in my life. I stopped watching the show a while back and never really got back into it, when while I still enjoy zombies, I'm kind of burnt out by this iteration. That said, if you want an accurate representation of the Walking Dead type of zombies and the show in game, then this is it. One walk by themselves is no problem. Five is not great, and then 20 is a death sentence, and people are always trouble. In the end, I'd give this a 60 out of 100. The gameplay is okay, but just tweak those conversations so I'm not staring at a radio reading subtitles, and it'd easily be up like 20 points. But as is, I really didn't love it, and I'm gonna need to convince myself to go back for the DLC and the sequel. After this, the next game I completed was something I'd been playing off and on for a while, but for some reason got very obsessed with at the start of this month. Shapes is a factory building game where your entire goal is to create increasingly complex shapes and belt them to your main hub. There's no time limit, no resource cost apart from when you copy and pasting things, and no real limit to space in the map. Now it does sound like a boring sandbox, and yet it's somehow the most engaged that I've felt in a game in a very long while. Something about making a perfectly optimised factory that outputs a perfect full belt per second tickles that part of my brain that I try to keep unlocked so I can do work and be productive. Having this game running in the background of my PC was a dangerous game, as I'd hop on every once in a while to tweak something or make the next shape, but man, Oh man, I really enjoyed myself and got sucked in every single time. Even when the shapes were so complex, I literally had to draw diagrams to get them done. I was all for it. I really don't have a lot else to say about this one. You'll probably know if you're going to like it by looking at gameplay, since these sorts of games are just like that. If you like factory games, then you should absolutely give shapes a go, as it scratches that itch perfectly, and you can sink near endless hours in if you really want to be optimised. Plus, the sequel's just around the corner with Shapes 2, and is looking to be even better. An easy 80 out of 100. After this, I started the awful habit of getting into bed with my Steam Deck at night, and though my sleep quality plummeted, I also managed to get through like two games in basically one sitting. Those were Slay the Princess, and Milk, Inside a Bag of Milk, etc, etc. First up, Princess, I knew very little about this game, aside from the premise and a couple of I Can Fix It memes. I was going in blind, and let me tell you, that is the best way to play this game, so if you want to skip ahead and play it for yourself, which I would highly recommend, it's an 85 out of 100. Go to this timecode if you don't want to hear any spoilers. Okay, the game intro doesn't lie when it says you have to go to the cabin, find the princess, and slay her. What it doesn't account for is all the ways you can fuck that up or add your own little twist. 
how your literal conscience becomes its own entity, how time itself can tear apart and create a new being based on the experiences of the princess. I'm really not sure how to put into words how insane this game gets. I'm not even sure what actually happens, so explaining it to you is pretty much impossible, but it's really cool. In almost every outcome, the universe ends and all that's left is you and a new creature made up of the experiences of the princess. Every choice you make affects this new creature and how it thinks and feels, so you have to choose paths which give it the broadest experience of life and hope that it winds up happy. I don't think this game is really going for a right or wrong answer or a good or a bad ending. No matter what you do, the game and the creature react, even if it's something as small as a hesitation, an offhanded comments, or even the absence of doing anything at all. The performances here from the voice actors are outstanding, the writing is seriously good. I'm definitely only scratching the surface of this game. When I went back to get footage, I saw stuff that I never saw in my entire first playthrough. I could easily sing many, many more hours and see the countless endings, but I did technically roll credits, so that counts for the list. That being said, I'm probably going to come back to this one. Literally straight after I finished my first run through of this, I went onto milk inside a bag of milk. Cubed. Yeah, I, uh, I really don't entirely get this game. It feels like I've been placed inside someone's damaged mind. I'm trying to help them perform a basic task. The entire goal of the game is to help the girl get the damn milk and everything that happens along the way you have to help her navigate. It's an incredibly short game to play through like taking under 20 minutes without even rushing. It's less a game and more so a very short graphic novel. It's a little bit artsy but it's unlike anything that I've ever played and it's also dirt cheap so I can't give it lower than a 60. As far as gameplay goes there's hardly any but for weird abstract insane storytelling it hits all the marks in record time. I'm only marking it so low because it's so damn confusing and by the time I got to the end I didn't really know what I'd done. After those two, I took a little bit of a hiatus from completing anything, and I was still playing things, as you'll find out later, but it was my anniversary with my lovely girlfriend during this time, and on the day, we decided to watch The Last of Us. Now, I've never played the game despite owning it for years, you know, classic me, classic backlog, but even so, I knew just about everything that was going to happen in the show, since it's just impossible to avoid spoilers for an iconic game for that long. Even so, I really enjoyed the series. I think Pedro Pascal is one of the highest actors right now, both in terms of career and uh, otherwise. And on top of that, it got me wanting to finally play the game to see the differences between it and the show, if nothing else. Also, real quick, the show is an 80, great performances, and the story was translated really well from the game. So, I was playing the PC port, and initially, I tried to play it on my Steam Deck, and these days, it does technically run, but it can run the game in the sense that I can run a marathon, just barely, and not really in an acceptable state. So after kicking things off in bed one night, I continued on my PC and finished it there. And uh, holy moly, this game holds up. Obviously, graphically, it's got improvements since launch, but I mean, gameplay wise, this game is just tight. I think I just expected it to be a boring cover shooter, but what I got was an intense survival horror game where every bullet counts, making each missed shot feel like another nail in my coffin. And I was only playing on normal. Seriously, at the end of big fights, I would have like three bullets left and be physically tense from the stress of it. Everything plays so well from the stealth to the gunplay to the crafting, it all just feels so good and made for a very addicting gameplay loop that I couldn't help coming back to. The puzzles were a little bit ass and basic, but uh, you can't win them all. Obviously, I don't need to tell anyone here that this story is one of the best gaming has ever seen. What is it about grumpy old dudes learning to be parents again with annoying little beat kids that just hits every single time? God of War has done it twice and this game nails it too. For some reason, that trope never fails to get me feeling things despite not having, not wanting kids myself. Real quick, if I'm comparing this to the show, I think both did some things better than the other. The relationship between Joel and Ellie in the game felt a lot more naturally built up over time compared to the show, where they have a big argument and then have best buds the next morning. That being said, I complete the game in about 12, 13 hours, and I believe the entire show is just under 8 or 9 hours. So it makes sense that they'd have a better relationship in the game where all of your time is spent just with those two building up their relationship. However, the show does have gay sex, so you know, that's a dub, and also makes one of the loneliest characters in the game get a bit more of a happy ending in more ways than one. We love you, Bill. I'll probably come back to this later and get through on the hardest difficulty and try and get all the collectibles, but this first run was a total pleasure and my only regret is I didn't play this game earlier. Despite what I've heard, I'm relatively excited to play the next one, but as far as this first game is concerned, it's a very solid 90. After this, I fully dedicated myself to something that I should have finished long ago, and I really don't know what I can say about this that hasn't already been said, but... Baldur's Gate 3. Man, what a game. Honestly, calling it a game kind of feels like I'm doing it a disservice because this has become so much more than just something fun to play. It is undoubtedly the most impressive thing to be released in recent times in any category, in any medium, and it absolutely deserves every single award it got. It did make the award shows a little bit boring, but it deserved it. Now, I had actually attempted finishing this game not long after it released, and I got all the way to Act 3 and then went on holiday, and I don't think this game runs very well on Steam Deck, it's verified, I don't agree with that, it runs like shit, it looks like shit, and it eats all your battery, so I wasn't willing to play it on that. And uh, when I got back, I didn't pick it up again, and by the time I did eventually come back to pick it up, I'd forgotten everything I was doing, and I just couldn't get back into the rhythm of it. So, I refreshed and started all over again, 
and I'm so glad that I did. This time around, I went for a ranger and that fit my playstyle so much better and uh, I'm in love with literally everyone in this game. It should really come with a warning that your pants may contain nuts when talking to literally anyone. This time I romance Karlak and I have not simped for a game character this hard since Panam in Cyberpunk and uh, to be honest between those two, it's not even that close a race. I want her to break my spine but also I want to protect her from anything bad happening to her ever, ever again. This is technically very, very mild spoilers. Skip ahead like 10 seconds if you don't want to hear about something that happens in the Karlak romance but going on a date in the city was the cutest and then hottest and then saddest thing that I've ever seen and played through in a game and I would be lying if I said I didn't well up several times when playing this masterpiece of a game. Everyone here is just so well written and performed that you can't help but fall in love with them. My main squad was Tav, Karlak, Shart and Gale but even the limited interactions I had with Astarian and Bazel were enough to make me care about them. Everyone has complete stories with multiple endings and helping them all become their best selves and get revenge on those who wronged them was equal parts satisfying and bittersweet pretty much every single time. Yeah, mild spoilers, this is a grown up game and it's not afraid to stab you in the guts at any moment, even a triumphant one. While there are absolutely some quote unquote happy endings, most come with a final twist of the knife to keep things tense and grounded. Also, even those happy endings aren't set in stone as anything being the correct good ending. Nearly every outcome for nearly every quest has some level of moral ambiguity to it, leaving you rethinking every single decision you make. It sounds frustrating and sometimes it can be, but it's the best way possible. If I'm pondering over if I made the right decision in a video game for that long, that's how you know you're onto something special. Story aside, the gameplay here is also just incredible. Combat is an insane amount of fun and even the hardest, most frustrating fights were super satisfying once you finally figured them out. The joy of landing a perfect barrel fire combo or knocking some major enemies off the map with a well-placed thunder arrow, it just all never got old. And even when the controls balked and I swang at nothing, you just can't help but laugh. When you're not fighting, it's mainly exploring and talking to people and not one area of the game is weak. Each of the maps are densely populated with things to do, people to talk to, quests to complete, you're regularly rewarded for exploring and gathering information you can use to outsmart enemies, and the story reacts to basically everything you can do no matter how minor and it just makes the world feel real. I want to make a video about this feeling in particular but when I complete this game it felt kind of similar to morning. I loved every moment of the ride and I would love to get back on one day to try a Dark Urge playthrough but for now I have to leave Faerun behind and I'm extremely sad to see it go and I will never forget my time with this game and its characters. Larian have raised the bar to heights never seen before in gaming and I cannot wait to see what manages to top it. I could very easily give this a perfect 100 but the only show I have is some technical bugs here and there and occasionally the game does some weird stuff if you've done certain actions which kind of pull you out of the world. Anyway, despite the occasional hiccup, this game is absolutely a masterpiece and easily worthy of a 95. And with that, February draws to a close and March begins. With a week away on the horizon towards the end of this month, I'm hoping to cross another few games off my list before I leave and then Steam Deck or Switch my way through another few while I'm gone. But that's next month. If you have any games you'd like me to check out, then let me know in the comments below. Like, subscribe, and if you want more months in review, then check out this video on what I played in January.